I still identify more as a sports player. Uh, you know, I, I do all my auditions that way. Uh, when I was in Winnipeg, I played for about a year and a half in fifths. I'm such a fan of today's guest. He's a great friend, colleague. We serve on the ISB board together, and he's doing incredible things. And we're talking about a project he's been involved with for many years that has a new addition. Uh, am I teasing this long enough? I'm Jason Heath. <laughs> this is Controversy Conversations, and we're talking today with Travis Harrison, who is a freelance bassist in Toronto and a former member of the Winnipeg Symphony, and also a former student of Joel Corrington. And while he was working with Joel, he had had the idea to take the way that Joel worked and taught and approached the bass and turn it into the Canadian School of Double Bass. This was released several years ago on iBooks, and Travis has been working tirelessly to create these new editions of the Canadian School of Double Bass, fourths tuning and fifths tuning. They're available through Joel's website. We have that all linked up. They are awesome. So we certainly talk about that, but also Travis's background, how he got into music, moving around and living in different parts of Canada, and all kinds of things. Definitely check out the show notes so that you can check out his website, his Instagram, the Canadian School of Double Bass on Joel Quarrington's website. We've even got a dissertation by an Australian jazz bassist named Samuel Dobson about the Canadian School of Double Bass and applying it to a jazz context. Very interesting. Quick shout out to our sponsors, Dorico Ear Trumpet Labs and Modacity. More on them in a bit, but let's talk with my friend, Travis Harrison. Are the second Canadian I've talked to today. I was actually just talking to Patrick Staples. Um, who, oh, cool. yeah. I, 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 I'm guessing maybe your paths have overlapped, but um, he's been he's been getting into making bows. I don't know if you've tried yeah. tried out any of his bows, but um, the he um, he was in Winnipeg mm -hmm. just I think the year before. Actually, I, I think I may have won his old position. Okay, okay. Uh, I think that's what happened. But um, yeah, so we, we've met a couple of times. I haven't tried any of his bows, but a, a buddy, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Theo Chan, mm -hmm. he's a bassist with the TSO. Mm -hmm. um, he and Patrick go back and forth all the time, it seems, but Theo got really into doing bow rehairs and started making bows and Patrick started doing the same thing. Um, but I've seen I've seen photos of them. They look they look gorgeous. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to. It. I have a couple coming my way actually. So my former stu student who's principal based in Lyric Opera in Chicago right now. Um, he and Patrick are like this exact same cohort. They went through Colburn and then Rice and then have kept in touch. And so Ian has been playing on one of his bows and loves it and, and recommended him for an interview. And, and Ian rarely makes recommendations, but when he does, they're always good. So it was, uh, yeah. that was fun. And it's, it, it's funny. I've had this weird, I have finally now had Canadian, like enough Canadians on the podcast that it isn't weird, but I went through this long, streak the only person i had ever had on from canada was joel corrington oh no that's not true joel corrington and then there was a, a gentleman passed away a few years ago older guy from vancouver with these great stories robert meyer i think his name was uh okay. no but now i've gotten a guy james Han i've, I've uh, it's not I'm, I'm not weirdly uh deficient in canadian guests but uh well okay. <laughs> <laughs> there it's uh the, the fun thing to do in Canada is compare the population of Canada to the population of California. So yeah, we're like almost, <laughs> almost, what is Canada? Is it, is it 20, 25 million, something? In the you know, we just had another census like last week mm -hmm. and the last one, I think we were around 33, 35. Oh, million. that much. Okay. So you're a pro, you're, yeah. so it's similar. I mean, California, I, I think they actually, we actually lost population this year. Um, <laughs> no. I, I'm sure that the, for many reasons probably, uh, but uh, so, but we're, we're just, just under 40. So yeah, actually it's pretty close. Yeah. And we're a big state, but the land mass obviously is so, I mean, it's just so crazy that Toronto and Vancouver, and then I was taught, and then uh, Patrick's in Calgary and, you know, these are yeah. all, and then Montreal, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's wild. Totally spread apart. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting place. And um, I've gone to see a lot of parts of the country that I think uh, a lot of people don't necessarily just, um, helping my father with his his work occasionally and 
he does cell phone towers. Like he, oh. he's an engineer, structural engineer. And so we end up going off to middle of nowhere places. Um, like really, like it takes eight hours to get there. And then you inspect this thing and then you drive, drive back. It's overwhelming. And when I lived in Winnipeg, uh, you know, it would take two full days of nonstop driving to get back to Toronto every summer. It's crazy. Well, I, I, I've, I've, I've complained so many times about the weather in South Dakota, and then I can't help but think about you in Winnipeg, like a six-hour drive. So it's like, take, take Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which has a lot of nice features, but not good weather. And then, I, I don't think anyway, and then like go six hours north. It's not going to improve. You know, it, Canada is it, unlike Australia in many ways, but in one way, it's like, it's always struck me, you know, in general, you've got these fairly large cities separated by vast distances, you know. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it's it's a weird it's a weird place uh, for people who come from somewhere like the U.S. or Europe. Uh, and I, I like biking a lot, so my my friends and I are always trying to plan bike trips, and they always end up going into the U.S. because in Canada, if you want to bike to the next city, it will take like a week. <laughs> Whereas uh, I think in the U.S., if you go straight down, we got to Boston in about six days from uh, Montreal, mm-hmm. and we saw so many neat little communities on the way. You just don't get that kind of thing in Canada uh, the same way. So it's, yeah, it's a little bit spread out, and um, you know, because of because of our instrument and stuff, it can be hard to uh, connect with people across the country sometimes. So Patrick, for instance, I've only met him in person maybe uh, twice. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he was dating a friend of mine at one point, and then another time, uh, uh, Winnipeg Symphony used to go on these uh, ski trips every year. And the best skiing spot in Canada is the uh, the Rockies. And so we'd fly out to Calgary and go to Banff. Mm-hmm. And uh, Patrick came out one day then and really interesting guy, which I wish that we were in the same city for a while longer. So that because he, he seems like a great guy and uh, obviously up to some really interesting things and fantastic bass player from what I hear as well. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Our, our colleagues in Winnipeg uh, spoke very highly of him when they got there to us. Missed, missed them. <laughs> well, Toronto is one of those places. I feel like such a fool for all the places I haven't been in, in Canada. But Toronto is one of them. I've never been to Toronto, which is like this wor- giant world class city and then you know you at least someone like me you think about canada i sort of almost forget like toronto's probably got better weather than a lot of the united states you know i mean because like toronto's right there in terms of uh is it latitude uh with with, like a lot of the major u.s cities it's it's another great lakes megapolis yeah yeah we uh you know it's like 28 well celsius 28 celsius out today uh Real warm. We had our first flowers blooming about a month ago. It's it's a it's a big change from Winnipeg for sure. <laughs> we still get four seasons, and it's yeah, yeah. You get the same kind of microclimate. Uh, you know, I took up surfing this winter, and I was doing a bunch of surfing in the Great Lakes uh, here. And they actually stayed unfrozen for a long enough time that you get into it. What is great? What is Great Lakes surfing like? Uh, can can you get? Okay, because I mean, like I lived on the, on Lake Michigan for a long time. I I remember seeing like paddleboard. I don't remember. Uh, I know it's a thing. I know even like Gulf Coast surfing is a thing down in Texas. Um, maybe they get a bit more surf, but you can, you can actually catch catch some waves. Here's the thing, Jason. <laughs> I have no idea what like real surfing is like. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've I've only ever surfed on a lake. It's like. Uh, I, I just started this year. So from what I understand, um, the way that the waves are built is different, right? Because uh, we don't have tides on the lakes, of course. And um, you basically have to wait for a day where the wind is blowing a constant direction for three or four hours. And that builds up the waves. And then it starts being good enough to surf. I mean, I can, I can see it happening. I remember some fearsome uh, waves on Lake Michigan. I mean, I, I, I saw some things that, that were pretty, pretty freaky in those years in Chicago. It's, it's funny being out here. I don't, I don't surf, but a few bass players I know do surf, including Dan Smith, who is the assistant, uh, uh, yeah, assistant principal bassist of San Francisco Symphony. He grew up in yeah. California and never surfed, but then uh, went to a couple different schools, came back to California and started surfing. And so he goes out to Ocean Beach here in San Francisco. Uh, he would go out before rehearsal, you know, 
know, like wake up and check the surf forecast and hit the waves. And what a, what a cool way to start the day. But that's like, that's no fooling around ocean beach. Those are like, those are some, those are some waves. Some serious breaks and stuff. Yeah. I bet. I, I mean, I, my friends and I want to go to La Jolla in mm -hmm. uh, like 2022 or 23 when we can, when we can travel again and just, you know, get to one of those old people communities where you can get some, Tacos on the beach, couple mm -hmm. surveys, screw up to the water for a bit. It, it's, uh, a, nice. it's it's incredible how um, some of the calm. And again, I know nothing about surfing, but I'm living out here in California. I'm kind of learning a little bit about the culture. You know, some of the calmest yeah. places are not too far from some of the roughest waters. Like Mavericks is this like notoriously uh, uh, dicey surf spot. And my my, my wife and I've get, it's just a, you know as you're heading down the coast, we've gone out just to like sort of check out what it's all about. But then just north in Pacifica is like, I think one of the best places for getting started with surfing and you're driving down highway one on the coast and you see all these people just getting into the waves and it looks um, quite, quite calm. I think Ocean Beach is a little bit more expert. My wife's actually been getting into stand up paddle boarding. She went and took a lesson <laughs> on Sunday, but it was, it's been very windy here in San Francisco. So it was really easy going one direction and she was like blowing like a sail trying to come back in. So yeah. 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 Has, has your dog started balancing on the board yet? Yeah, well, they, they, I know people do that. And so yeah. we went, I, I took the dog down and we watched her go and watched her come back and I was taking some videos, but so maybe we'll see if she, um, <laughs> if she makes a habit of it and gets one. Um, there's there's a, a aquatic park is this area here where people go swimming all year in the bay. It's the bay is always cold, but it's uh, I think it's a little bit uh, it might not be any warmer, but that's where people swim anyway. And so you you can launch out from there on the paddleboard, and you see people heading towards the Golden Gate Bridge. You just want to pick the right the right circumstances. So yeah, yeah you need to you need to wait for the good weather. It, that looks like so much fun. <laughs> it look it, it looks like fun for sure. And she had a good time. Didn't fall in or anything like that but yeah yeah you'll have to you have to uh give give a try at some surfing out here one of these days yeah, I, I, i'm dying to travel again and uh you know not just for, for playing music but it's fun to fun to do stuff like that i've got a buddy who just um he was a chamber music uh acquaintance a cellist back here that just moved back to australia and he was actually saying that the the australian chamber orchestra is like a it's like a surf club Whenever they're not playing music together, all they want to do is surf. I, I haven't heard anyone corroborate that, but it, uh, I imagine that if if that was like my life in Australia, just playing music and surfing, man, it would be amazing. This episode is brought to you by Ear Trumpet Labs. They make an incredible mic for upright bass called the Nadine. And six-time Grammy-winning jazz bassist and former Contra Bass Conversations guest, Christian McBride is a big fan. Christian says, as an acoustic bassist, it's very important for me to have this instrument amplified as naturally as possible. What I love about this microphone is that it makes the instrument sound exactly how I hear it in my head. Honestly, I don't know if you can get a better review than that. The Nadine is an instrument-mounted condenser mic with an incredibly clear natural sound and great feedback rejection. Ear Trumpet Labs is offering a free t-shirt with mic purchase from their website. Just visit www.eartrumpetlabs.com slash contrabass to claim yours and learn more about Nadine. I'm so happy that my course Beginners Classical Bass is out in the world on Discover Double Bass and we've been getting some great feedback. Here's Barry Green, instructor of bass at The Ohio State University, former principal bassist of the Cincinnati Symphony and author of The Inner Game of Music. Barry writes about the course. This wonderful extensive course includes 14 chapters of 66 lessons varying in length from one to eight minutes each. It is so comprehensive. While it is called a beginner's course, this only means that the course begins with the parts of the instrument, including how to take the bass out of the case. However, it also takes the player through the most advanced left and right hand techniques, including shifting, pivoting, harmonics, positions up to thumb position, tuning the bass, scales and arpeggios, as well as left hand techniques of dynamics, bow placement, articulations, including portato, staccato, and slurring. Barry, thank you so much. And folks, if you haven't checked it out, you can find it through the link in the show notes or just visit discoverdoublebass.com slash Jason Heath. 
life. This episode is brought to you by Dorico, the advanced music notation software from Steinberg. And one of the coolest things about this piece of software, there's so many things, but one of them is their popover option. And it has sped up things so much for me when I'm working in scores. Here's senior product manager Daniel Spreadbury on how popover mode works. There's like hundreds of notations that you might want to create and trying to remember what to type, you know, oh, is it command shift alt, you know, Vulcan death grip seven <laughs> for this particular notation. <laughs> but the nice thing about a popover is all you have to remember is the letter of the thing you want to create. So D for dynamics, T for tempo, M for meter, K for key signature. It might seem like a simple thing, but you would not believe how much that has sped up my workflow. And I'm not even really a composer. I do a lot of arrangements. I do a lot of exercises, but it has taken my workflow probably at least up to five times faster. Just that one mode. I can't say enough good things about Dorico. I love it. I use it every single day. There's a free version, Dorico SC, that you can download that lets you do practically everything for up to two stabs. So check it out. Dorico.com will take you to their page on Steinberg's website. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. 2019 seems like a hundred years ago at this point, but 2019 yeah. fall, I was in Australia for a couple of weeks and I, I saw an Australian chamber orchestra concert and hung out with uh, Max Bibo, the principal bassist. And his, yeah. he lives on the beach in Sydney. It's like your, what, what you'd picture. It's like th their version of like, you know, California beach culture kind of is awesome. See, I don't know if he surfs, but I wouldn't be surprised. It's a, it's a, I could definitely see that orchestra doing that <laughs> <laughs> Man, i hope so i mean they, they, it's one of my favorite sounding groups and uh oh yeah the, the added character of like them all being hardcore surfers just adds to the mystique for me <laughs> that was that was an awesome concert first of all, i got to play on max's uh 1500s whatever air gasparo de solo play a few notes on yeah. that and then the hall they play in sydney I, I they travel but the hall that they were at in sydney is this um new modern hall right downtown sydney i forget the name town Center Hall, something like that. But the program was awesome. Just everything about it, really dynamic performance, young audience packed. It was, it was, it was cool. Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> how, how has it been? It's been, it looks like it's been rough in Canada in terms of the virus. Like, like how is, how are things, because things are like feeling much more positive here. As Patrick was saying, things seem to be getting better. Vaccination rates are going up, at least in Calgary. How, I know it's been, you went back into like a pretty hardcore lockdown, if I remember right. Yeah, you know, it's, it's complicated. Um, and I'm sure there, there are better people like more educated people than me. But um, be, what we were talking about earlier about Canada being so spread out, uh, every province, basically the federal government made it so every province is managing themselves, mm -hmm. right? Um, because it makes sense. Uh, the problems in, in British Columbia are totally different than the problems in Quebec. And, you know, they're 3,000 kilometers away from each other, right. uh, this kind of thing. But yeah, for. <laughs> In general, the response has been pretty um, like strict in terms of closing things down, and we're incredibly fortunate uh, in Canada to have like this support from the federal government. Everyone's um, the eligibility for getting our support checks is pretty. Uh, I don't know how to say this in a in a way that's not exclusionary, but like it's pretty open. Mm -hmm. um, if you've been working and, and whatever. And so they've been, they've been supporting us the whole time to get through paying rent and buying groceries and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit inequitable in other ways. Uh, professional sports have been able to sort of continue without much issue, even though they've had a lot of problems with like entire sports teams getting COVID. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, uh, live music has, or even recorded music has been banned basically. So in Toronto, um, in Ontario, I should say, Ontario is Toronto's in the province of Ontario. And, uh, you know, like film and television is allowed to go ahead and do production and stuff like that. And people are even allowed uh, in the rules to be within two meters, meters of each other and touch each other if it's needed for the production. But at the same time, you can't actually get together to stream a, a concert. So it's, there's a lot of this uh, stuff and I'm sure there's all sorts of politics and money and complications behind it, 
Um, but yeah, like the last the last gig I played was December 3rd. I did a, a stream with the Canadian Opera Company and we played an old Beethoven uh, program, mostly Beethoven program um, from beautiful new concert hall in, in Toronto at the conservatory, uh, Kerner Hall. And it was just so much fun. Um, and it was very safe and everyone had a great time. Uh, it felt just incredible, but we, we haven't been able to do anything since. Oh, and man. projects like I, I've got recording projects that keep being delayed and stuff like that. So it's, it's, yeah, it's rough. Um, but yeah, in terms of vaccines, it's getting better, right? Uh, I got my first vac. I'm, I'm technically in a hot spot, So mm -hmm. I was eligible for vaccine a little bit earlier than other people my age. And uh, it's coming along a bit better. Yeah. Well, we, we've been, we're, we're, I'm learning California's bad at lots of things and getting the vaccine. We're, I think we've been the, I don't remember the statistic, but something like the worst in the country in terms of actually getting oh, wow. it out. And then um, the Bay Area yeah. has actually been deprioritized for a bunch of, well, so anyway, long story, I, I am also now fully vaccinated but and it was funny to get the first shot because it was like me and on the whole like 20 something tech force of san francisco like everybody was young and healthy in my round yeah. they, the convention center uh you know they just it's this giant vaccination site so and things are definitely what you're describing sounds like this place in like january or february it was pretty i was there was probably like my darkest mood because things had opened up a little and then they and you're like oh there we can make music again and then like boom like, and it was similar to what you're describing the the film filming continues and so there are these heart-wrenching photos of like somebody whose restaurant they aren't even allowed to have people outside and right next to it is the craft service table for the film production but for, fortunately um every you know it's it's getting it, it's it, and what i would do is actually watch videos of australia um just to sort yeah. of remember there's some place in the world that's looking better the, the tough thing with Australia is that they're not getting vaccinated at a very high rate yet. So it's kind of like a disaster movie, right? Like they're, they're doing concerts and it looks normal, but if one thing breaks out, they shut down. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah but yeah. finally, you know, the restaurants are open, bars are open, c groups are announcing concerts. I finally left the city of San Francisco for the first time in 14 months last weekend. I went to Seattle, um, and that my base in the corner there still hasn't left the place since March of 2020, but <laughs> But I have things on the calendar. I, 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 I yeah. So anyway, I, I'm, I'm getting to be a, in a better psychological place. But still, in terms of like, it's a, t it's a tough time to be a musician in general. But particularly if you are working in any sort of freelance performance capacity, I just wonder. Like one of the things I love to do is sub with the San Francisco Symphony. I wonder the next time I'll get called for that is. Um, yeah. It'll be interesting yeah. to see. Could. Could be never, could be, could be sooner than I think, but that's, and I was talking to some of my other Bay Area friends who freelancing is a lot of what they do. And especially some people freelancing and they didn't do much teaching. It's, it's a, it's a rough place to be in. Yeah, it's, it's tough. And, um, you know, like I, I quit my job in Winnipeg, uh, my partner, one of, you know, like in my opinion, it's like the dream job for a cellist mm -hmm. in uh, Canada, mm -hmm. uh, the principal cello of the opera company. Mm -hmm. And the way they do the opera company, it's sort of two months on, two months off, two months on, two months off. And uh, there's no, you know, again, I, I hate to complain because I was so fortunate to like graduate school, get a job in a decent paying orchestra and with wonderful colleagues and stuff in Winnipeg. But man, I got so tired of playing like six days a week and pops concerts and mm -hmm. everything mixed in um, just three programs in one week. Mm -hmm. And with the opera, it's like you play six programs a year and it's all the most incredible music, you know, like Puccini and uh, Vorjak and Strauss and whatever. It's so much fun. Um, but it's scary uh, because, you know, all these orchestras want to have auditions as well. There's an older generation uh, retiring. But if, if you take examples of other orchestras around the country or around the world that have gone through tough times, and I think every orchestra now is going to be going through a tough time, um, a lot of the time they don't audition for open positions for years, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Toronto Symphony, they've been down to seven bases for almost a decade now, I think. And at least when I was growing up, it was always an eight, eight base section. And uh, they still just haven't either gone around to it or maybe there's no 
the management's happy not having to pay for that eighth position or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, it's been great for my a couple of my pals uh, sub there all the time, and it's great for them. So that's that's wonderful. But hopefully, they keep getting that work when they have their opportunity, like when it comes back. One of the features that surprised me the most, but I have grown to love, is the rating system for your practice items in Modacity. Here's Mark Gelfel from Modacity on why it's important to rate your practice items. Being in touch with the level of mastery that you currently have on something that you're practicing allows you not only to know when you need to go back and practice it. For example, if you've got five stars of mastery, you don't need to practice something every day. But if it's one star, you need to be working on it to ramp it up and take advantage of the initial learning curve. It also allows you to prioritize your practice sessions. So um, our head of customer service, Jared, actually memorized 25 songs for a tour in just 16 hours. And the key for him was using the star rating system to prioritize what he needed to work on. He said it felt like cheating when he was finally at the rehearsal. (laughs) You can learn more about my favorite practice app and get a special deal on lifetime membership by visiting modacity.co slash CBC. And thank you, Modacity, for sponsoring the podcast. When I was recently chatting with Gary and Eric of Upton Base, I asked them, How did they do what they do? How do they build their presence and be so top of mind among bassists around the world? Here's what they said. My ego doesn't want to say this, right? And Eric's won't like it either. But because of the timing, we couldn't do again what we've done. Yeah. And what they have done is absolutely extraordinary from their beginnings as an accessories shop online to now making over 120 bases a year. They're coming up as I record this on 1,700 bases. They've got an army of satisfied customers who bought multiple bases. They're just really doing great things. They do great work and stand behind their products. Check them out at uptonbase.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast, guys. It'll be interesting to see. I'm going to do my part to be at every concert I can. I'll tell you that. I'm getting. I, I'm so much happier now than I was like four months ago or so. Just, just, just having things be a bit looser. And we. One of the advantages of living in California is that the climate's nice enough to do stuff outside. So, but large ensemble performances we haven't seen much of. But the groups are announcing their seasons, and things are things are moving more rapidly than. Jason from January would have expected. So we'll see. Anything could happen. Things could turn around, but um, I'm happy that I'm going to Texas next week. I'm doing a, a music festival in LA that, that got announced. So doing a teaching festival again. And so uh, it's good oh, to ho- hopefully, hopefully that's going to, you know, that's going to roll, <laughs> roll across. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think we're going to start seeing that here too. Um, it's, it's tough. We get, I, I was recently brought on to help, uh, organize and program a music festival that I've been playing at um, the past few summers. And like the goalposts keep changing, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, One week we have the government saying like, you know, Pride Parade is shut down in Toronto. There's not going to be a Caravana Festival, which those are two of the biggest events that Toronto has every year. And then the next week our uh, premier, which I guess is sort of like our governor uh, equivalent, Mm -hmm. says, oh, summer camps are definitely going to happen. And so it's like, how do you, how do you plan? <laughs> yeah. How do you plan for festivals and plan repertoire? And um, I've still got a Vaughn Williams quintet that we've, we've put off for a year and a half now that we're supposed to play. And 
yeah, it's it's brutal. It's not not an easy time to plan. I cynically, I I, I got to think that like here in California, we had been as shut down as you can imagine, and our governor is being recalled, and all of a sudden he started to loosen things up in a hurry. Um, I think maybe political pressure. So, but we were like, yeah. you know, quite, so I don't know. That may have, but but it, it might have gone this direction anyway. But regardless, it looks like it looks like things are are moving in that direction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Knock it, knock it. Where's my wood? Right here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, I look forward to seeing you out here, whatever that may be, and uh, uh, showing you the the surf spots that I know. And uh, have you have you spent have you spent time out here before, either San Francisco I, or? Yeah, I've been to San Francisco a couple of times. Um, last time was twenty fourteen. Uh, I was there for a couple of weeks. Um, yeah, but not as much. Uh, I guess. I've spent a lot more time in New York. My brother lived in New York City for about a decade. And, um, you know, a lot of the the festivals uh, would audition there. Where they might not come to Toronto, but if you want to audition for New World Symphony or something, you could just drive down to New York City. Mm -hmm. And from Toronto, it's only eight hours. I lived in Montreal for a long time. It was only a six-hour drive, uh, pretty dependably. So, because you went to McGill, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did my undergrad at McGill. Um, okay. Which which was great. I, I did my master's in Ottawa, which is just about two hours further north uh, from there. Yeah. And were you studying with Joel when you were at in Ottawa, or who were you studying with in Ottawa? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, it's it's interesting. My my studies with Joel, um, we. I sort of became aware of him when I was in youth orchestra growing up in Toronto because he was principal bass of the Toronto Symphony and um, before that he was principal bass of the opera and before that it was Hamilton Philharmonic so he and he grew up in Toronto as well so the music scene here is like forever changed uh, by his by his presence which is fantastic um, and. I, so I, I graduated high school in 2006 and started immediately at McGill. And at the time I was studying with the acting principal base, I guess, uh, Brian Robinson, wonderful guy and, you know, a fun teacher to work with. Um, but the whole time, like growing up in youth orchestra, there was always a couple of Joel students there. Uh, whenever there were bass master classes in Toronto, it was usually something that he had organized uh, and he'd bring people in from... Uh, he had Hal Robinson coming up regularly, I think, and uh, he had some guys coming in from Germany and wherever. So he was always sort of around. And um, it, it was funny, actually, the, the very first orchestra I played in where there wasn't like one of Joel's students or someone tuning in fifths was a festival orchestra in Germany. So, and I had been playing for a while by that point. So, uh, I, he was always sort of around in my life, and of course, our teachers have a huge effect on us. But I personally learned a lot from people just around me as well, um, whether they're cellists or violinists or they're bass players. So it was always uh, I always saw what was going on, and um, eventually started studying with Joel my last year of my undergraduate degree at McGill. Oh, okay. uh, but I worked at, with him at a festival and. Uh, Pinkus Zuckerman used to run this fantastic festival in Ottawa, Young Artist Program, they called it. And uh, so Joel would teach there. It's a three week long thing. Um, like many things in Canada, it was just completely publicly funded. So you could go and spend three weeks playing chamber music and whatever. And uh, yeah, so in 2009, I, I got into that and worked with him and just totally fell in love with the technique and the stuff he was showing. It made a lot of sense for me. And I think it was at a good time in my life when I was ready to really like buckle down and work instead of, um, I, I don't know, for, for me, university was so difficult because there were so many distractions and classes and stuff. And especially somewhere like McGill, it's, uh, I think it's regularly like the top university in Canada, and one of the top universities in the world, and the academic side of it is like that's like it's like the Harvard of Canada, right? It's like that's like a serious business school. <laughs> well, that's that's what they print on their sweatshirts. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, they, they do it the other way around: Harvard, United States, McGill. <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So. Um, 
I was really blessed. Uh, my guidance counselor at McGill was actually um, Jonathan Crow, who's he was like the youngest concertmaster ever of the Montreal Symphony, and now he's the concertmaster of the Toronto Symphony. But at the time, he was just the violin professor at McGill, and I guess part of his professorship, he had to also be a guidance counselor. <laughs> <laughs> So I was one of those keen kids that would go to um, go to the guidance sessions. Uh, most people just didn't. And basically, he gave me this brilliant idea of getting all my academic courses done uh, in the first three years. And then for the fourth year, I could be part time, uh, save a bunch of money and really focus on like getting ready for recital, grad school auditions, whatever. And uh, yeah, so everything just aligned perfectly. Um, 2006, Joel finished with the Toronto Symphony and started with the uh, National Arts Center Orchestra, which is sort of, um, well, it's on paper, it's definitely the best job in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, best everything, I think. Um, Toronto and Montreal, of course, are excellent as well. But uh, yeah, so he started there and he was driving to Montreal once a week uh, on Sundays, usually to teach his, his studio. Wow. So, <laughs> Well, and uh, yeah, and then and then yeah, Miguel finished. He didn't want to. He didn't want to drive over every week on a Sunday anymore. He had been teaching there for four years, and so he convinced me to move to Ottawa and study with him there. Wow. Uh, yeah. Well, you, you yeah you could pick you could you couldn't pick a better person to study with. Joel is. I mean, though I saw Joel's. He did a recital at, De was it 2017 Ithaca that I saw him do a recital? I'm trying to remember. It was one of the recent yeah. ISB conventions, but I've seen, with, yeah. With Don Thompson when he played that beautiful uh, jazz jazz piece. And yeah. Then sang Berkeley Square. Yeah. And I'd certainly heard him yeah. on recording. I think that's the first time I heard him play live, but what a, what a, what a, what a cool person to have uh, kind of <laughs> like on the scene, kind of like his, inf you know, with, uh, so I'm guessing his, uh, he was the inspiration for experimenting with fifths tuning, or maybe just that that was in the air around you. Like when, when did you start playing around with that? Yeah. Well, um, Fifth tuning has always been a, it's been, like I said, it's been a part of my life. It's just, there's always been someone uh, around me <laughs> playing that way. And, um, you know, I, I actually, like right now I've got, this one's in fourths, mm -hmm. this one's uh, the foremost fifths. And I sort of go back and forth between the two occasionally. Um, I still identify more as a fourths player. Uh, you know, I, I do all my auditions that way. Uh, when I was in Winnipeg, I played for about a year and a half in fifths. Uh, no one, no one seemed to notice actually, which was great. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so I, I actually didn't start playing in fifths uh, really until I was already in Winnipeg. Wow. Um, I just sort of started doing it for fun. I was getting a little bit bored. Uh, we were doing a lot of outreach stuff actually as well. And this is something that Joel talked about in one of his recent interviews. Um, it's such a drag to have to have multiple bases around or to have to worry about having an extension or not. Mm -hmm. um, and in Winnipeg, the, you know, the, the weather was so brutal and my poor colleagues there, the, the concert hall is just like the worst piece of garbage, <laughs> like in terms of, um, facilities and stuff and so you know I'd, I'd have this space there for a lot of the time and every year I was spending about two thousand dollars in getting repairs done uh cracks glued up whatever and you can imagine like getting into your car uh driving for 10 or 15 minutes to go to work when it's negative 40 outside and the base is in the back oh it's just awful yeah so one of the big reasons I started doing it there was as I was doing so many at a quintet and we did a lot of outreach stuff at schools and uh, Sistema and things like that. And, uh, you know, a lot of the time the kids would want to come up and play the bass and whatever. And I didn't really want to let them touch that one or I didn't necessarily want to travel with it. And my, my second bass, uh, it's a wonderful little Hofner bass that didn't have an extension. I didn't really want to spend money putting it on. And uh, it sounded great tuned in fifth. So I just started using that for all of our every shows. And then I started using it in the pit and at Pops concerts. And we had to play at like a casino. <laughs> and then 
before I knew it, it was like masterworks programs and whatever. And then I just did it basically full time for about a year, year and a half. Um, and I, I only stopped because uh, I had this thing happening at the Canadian Opera Company. Um, got a fantastic opportunity to play principal bass there. Uh, the old principal bass was uh, going through some very bad health things. And we were doing Arabella, which is this Strauss opera notoriously difficult I think and not very often played and uh I just I just wasn't comfortable going to this orchestra that I'd never played with before with a bunch of bass players that I didn't know um and not necessarily being like 100% there mm -hmm. uh, it, because it, it takes time to to adjust and everything and I'd, I'd only been doing it for maybe half a year at that point so yeah I'd, I'd put the fourth strings back on went over there and played and then had a good time. <laughs> do, do, well, since, since you've been, you got both bases right there, two in, uh, in the fourth and then in fifth, does, do you need, yeah. do you need like an, like I, I'm an extraordinarily bad cellist, but I, I play a little bit of cello. I would demo on cello and like, oh, you know, my, yeah, my, cool. my brain, you know, it's like little easy bass that's tuned in a way that I don't understand. So I'm like a rock star on the D string and, and then I have to do some math in my head. Like, do you, do you, but you know, you talk to like Edgar Meyer, certainly I haven't talked to him about this but uh folks that always are in solo tuning at a certain point some of them just start to think of that as the tune they're not transposing in their head they're i mean i, th yeah. I heard people talking back in chicago about edgar meyer would come and sub in orchestras before he became like edgar meyer you know and he would have those solo strings on and he'd just play everything you know the, in the correct pitch just finger it like does your so his brain just works in that tuning i guess like do, does it is there an adjustment period for you or is it is it funky if you just like like how does that work for you yeah there was definitely an adjustment period um again because you know for instance in youth orchestra like our our coach would give us a fingering and for the guys tuned in fifths uh, they'd always have to think about it and figure it out and so while that was happening i was always thinking like oh that a string it's sort of like this a string but it's high instead of low mm -hmm. so i can think about like how i would finger something on the a string and just move it over and G string works the other way around, but the C string is a big one that uh, bass players don't really know about C strings. Um, that festival orchestra I was playing in, in Germany, we had five stringers. So I got pretty used to playing with the B string. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we tune it up to a C. Um, yeah, so there's definitely an adjustment period. Uh, sight reading, you know, it could be quite difficult, but it's like anything, you just sort of have to get into it. Um, and yeah, I can like I have I have students now both in fifths and in fourths, and I sort of go back and forth between the two. Um, occasionally, for instance, at Bond Williams, uh, it works much better in fifths than in fourths. Actually, <laughs> it's so much easier with all the all the extension stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and same with Dvorak Quintet. Uh, I love playing that piece tuned in fifths because it's so natural, so easy. The cello it gets along with the cello so well. Um, so there, there's stuff like that where it just sort of fits very nicely and it's a, it's a nice thing to do. Mm -hmm. And it sort of keeps my mind, uh, not that I'm terribly old yet, but it, it keeps me thinking. <laughs> I'm sure. I th I th my, my favorite, like, uh, person who experiments with tunings constantly is probably Dean Farrell. I don't know if you're familiar with Dean <laughs> Farrell. He's, uh, he was the principal bassist in Reykjavik, Iceland for a long time. And I think he still lives in Iceland. Fascinating person. I, I just, yeah, uh, anybody who knows Dean Farrell breaks out into a big smile when they hear the name Dean Farrell. He's from San Diego because of course, and, and is just like, I think he went to Juilliard and then he has got, he's gotten into the early he's like er, an early music like punk rock like rebel sort of person like he does he has I don't even know how to describe what he does but what but what one thing he does is he constantly is experimenting with different tunings like um they're not he's going into different tunings on the fly he's like switching and 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 it's just wild to watch him watch him play. he used to play jazz gigs and would tune everything up a half step which actually works really well if you're playing in flat keys and some bass players would come see a gig and, and say like what are you doing? Like, how, how are you playing what you're playing? Um, what, uh, just practically speaking, I mean, I get, okay, so you're, pr and correct me if I'm wrong, but probably if you're trying to get the strings, probably you're using a solo string for the A string, maybe, maybe not. And then D, obviously, and then you've got that B, you can tune up to a C. What do you do for the G string? Uh, so what, what would be the A string? Do you tune an A string down or? 
So the G string, yeah, the C usually is a B string. Mm -hmm. um, you know, domestics actually, they, they have C strings for fifths that they sort of keep a secret. Okay. You, have to, you have to go make a custom order <laughs> and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, the, the big the, the big problem is what do you do with the G? It's true. You can either get an uh, A string tuned down to a G, mm -hmm. and sometimes it works depending on the kind of string you use. Mm -hmm. um, sometime, sometimes I'll do that and put uh, what we call balls out, where you get the you know the ball backwards. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it, it adds a little bit of tension. Um, but more common is to get an F sharp solo string and tune it up to a G. Oh, sure. That makes sense. Especially if you're, especially if you have that extra tension on the E string. Cause I was thinking that might be weird to have like, a, 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 if you don't do the custom tomastic order and you have like a tighter and then you have like a looser A, that could be sort of a weird adjustment. Okay. Yeah. The, the worst, the worst that's ever happened is, uh, there was one summer that I was just like back and forth across the country and I went on a tour in Europe and like all this stuff was happening and like I had the spreadsheet. I have th I'm blessed I have three instruments, um, these two, and there's another sort of beater in the corner. And so I had to, I had like one base, I was living in Ottawa for all the things there. I had one base in Winnipeg that I had like summer season things. And then I had this beater base traveling with a friend of mine in the back of his car. And he took it out to Vancouver for me. Um, but it had the wrong set of strings with it. <laughs> and we were, we were doing it in four jack quintet and I, I was totally prepared to play in fifths, but it had just fourth strings. Mm -hmm. So I ended up having, a, I had two sets of fourth strings with it and ended up tuning the G up to an A. Mm -hmm. The bel canto took that mm -hmm. and it sounded fine. Actually, the D stayed as the D, the A went down to the G and then the E string went all the way down to a C. And that was floppy, but you know, it worked. It, it worked. It was okay. I, I think many a bassist has experimented. I did before I had an extension when we'd have, you know, it's, I'd be doing uh, Appalachian Spring, the small instrumentation or something. I would tune that down and you get used to it. You just, I would always have to be careful to not bow it sharp if I'm not careful. You know, it, it yeah. just becomes like yeah. a little bit unpredictable and certain bow strokes might not be as, as punchy as I like, but it, it does work in a pinch. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, you did that. yeah it, it worked. It was a bit of a pinch, but uh, no, one, no one complained except for me. So, <laughs> yeah, but um, you know, and, and Gensler, uh, I guess that's tempera or tempura, mm -hmm. whatever string style. And uh, for a long time, well, still, he, he's got no problem making uh, fifths tuned strings and stuff like that. Um, right now, I've got two dominants on, on this one with uh, two eudoxa, like a eudoxa C and a eudoxa G. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, Prashra will make a fifth set of eudoxins. Um, again, you just have to ask them for it. Okay. And that's uh, that's actually the setup that Joel's been using. The the Bach videos that we did recently, he was using that as well, and it works quite nicely. Um, in this climate, it works to have jet strings. In Winnipeg, the uh, winding would come loose because they were so dry. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it has a nice effect, and it's, uh, it works works nicely. Yeah. What's your What's your take? Because I know you've been you, you've been doing this for a few years, but you've also been involved. I think there's a fifth tuning Facebook group that you've been involved with. And so, <laughs> like, like, what's your take on the adoption of fifths tuning in general? I don't know. I, I I know you. I know Joel. I know a few other people, and of course, people in throughout history wasn't. Who's the jazz bassist? Was it Red Mitchell or somebody yeah, that, that played? The fifth? So it's not like this is new. Um, but it, it, what's your take on? Do you think that it's been adopted more widely and maybe Joel's the, the new book, which we should definitely talk about. Uh, maybe that will help. Cause I I'm guessing there's probably nothing formal out there in terms of fifth pedagogy, or maybe I'm wrong un until this well, book. There isn't much. Um, I know Paul Unger who's in Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that he has a book with fifths uh, methodology and stuff like that. But then, um, but yeah, you know, it was, it was this big thing, you know, I, I don't want to give a history lesson, but it was a big thing back in the 1800s, 1700s, whatever. And uh, I think France was like the last place to sort of hold on to this uh, idea of having mixed sections or just having uh, fifths tuned things. And 
you know, to be honest, I can't imagine doing it back then because the strings would have been so hard to, to push down. So I'm not surprised at all that that, that changed. Um, but, you know, like Joel right now, uh, he, he's a better person to talk to about this, but um, most of his students are in fourths. Mm -hmm. The guy plays in fourths all the time. He, he still sounds just as incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, and in my opinion, you know, it, it doesn't really have anything to do with the tuning system. It's just, it's more the technique, actually. And it's one of the reasons um, I wrestled for a while about starting to tune my bass in fifths when I was in school. And I had a couple of friends, uh, a number of people uh, who are still, you know, playing bass today. I'm not sure if they're in fifths anymore, in fourths, uh, but they're over in Europe. Callum Jennings, uh, Nicholas Chalk. Mm -hmm. I think they're both with the Oslo Opera right now. And um both fantastic like really really incredible bassists and i remember talking with them about it and they were just saying listen man like you've got all these problems fifth tuning isn't going to fix any of these. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true you know like it's not going to make you play uh necessarily better and the wonderful thing is when i when i started doing it um i already had the technique joel's technique working in forks and in my opinion, you really need that sort of idea about flexibility and left-hand flexibility in order to make it work. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have to get maybe a cut. Some people get around it by getting a cut down size bass with a shorter string length. Um, but if you want to use a regular bass, you really need to have this, this sort of flexibility and ability to uh, pivot or rotate, as we call it, and, mm -hmm. and all these other things. Um, yeah, but in terms of adoption, I don't know. Uh, they did Joel again. Sorry to keep talking about Joel, but he he's sort of synonymous with this fifth tuning idea. Uh, he just did a fantastic interview with this bass magazine and new bass magazine in Europe, and uh, the headline from that is: "I think everyone will be tuning their bass eventually, but it might take a hundred years." <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, I think you know, I think that would be great. Um, we that player your player base and fifths uh, Facebook group, it's it goes through waves of activity and every once in a while the puck gets stirred with someone saying like oh did you know that this person played in fifths I had no idea. Um, the latest one was Alex Hanna from Chicago, right? Uh, he's he's been experimenting with the tuning, and um, there are a number of people you know. Principal bass in uh, Symphony Nova Scotia, that's in Halifax. Uh, principal bass of Violon de Roi, which is, like, in my opinion, like the greatest uh, period instrument group that we've got in Canada, or maybe not period instrument, but sort of Baroque uh, focused ensemble. Um, he's in fifths, Raph, Raph McNabney, I think that's his name. Fantastic sounding bass group. It's just incredible watching them. Uh, there are a couple, you know, there's Gang Fiena doing it, they're, they're sort of spread all over the world. Um, but one of the ideas behind these Canadian School of Double Bass production things that we're starting to do is uh, at least making it accessible. So mm -hmm. people who are curious uh, have an idea of how to do it. Um, I do a lot of technical work for Joel, like I built his website and I help him maintain it and stuff. And so I, I have access to the analytics and stuff. And there are hundreds of people visiting his website every week. And most of them are looking at the articles about fifths tuning. Um, so it's it's an interesting thing to see. But again, there, there's so little uh, material out there for ideas about how to, you know, how do you play Bodice in Concerto at an audition if you're tuned in fifths? Do you play it at pitch or do you play it down a tone like everyone else? Mm. Uh, this kind of thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's... Uh, we're, we're hoping to make it a little bit more accessible for people. And there are some, you know, the, the first thing that we've got coming up next is the edition of Garden Scene um, mm -hmm. that Joel worked on with his uh, old student, Gabrielle Sakamoto, another wonderful uh, bass player. And uh, the two of them have got this together and it, it's basically a sheet music edition. It has the fifths part with all the fingerings and bowings and a clean fifths part. And it has a fourth part with all the fingerings and bowings and the clean fourth part, and then piano parts for orchestra tuning or solo tuning or fifth tuning. Um, the solo tuning and the fifth tuning are the same. But just uh, 
just getting that done, you know, it's been, I've been trying to convince Joel to do that for years now and it's finally happening. So <laughs> hopefully it'll become more accessible. <laughs> well, I love this whole Canadian school of double bass. I love the books and the books that they're in a fifth and fourth edition. What, what a massive project. Uh, when, when did that start to coalesce? Yeah. Well, my, my opinion of it will be different, I think, than some people's. Okay. Um, Joel has been teaching at different festivals in or like Orford, Mount Orford Music Festival in Quebec uh, in particular for years. And so there were, it started sort of as a collection of exercises and stuff that make all the students do. And um, when I started studying with them, actually one of his students just invited me to a technique class. And basically the technique class, we go through these, uh, what used to be exercise one, two, three, and four. And uh, exercise one used to be a string crossing exercise. Exercise two was like a one fingered scale with uh, something similar to Gary Carr's vomit exercise, but a different a different reason behind it. Um, and you know these different exercises, and then so th that's been going on for a long time. Um, the Canadian School of Double Bass, as we have it today. Um, that was really a selfish endeavor on my part, actually. Uh, it was completely <laughs> selfish. And what happened is, you know, like I, I spent six years studying with Joel and, uh, or sorry, three years really, but six years going through school. And I guess I was really lucky. I, I worked really hard and won like the second audition I took, which was with Winnipeg Symphony. And um, very, very fortunate to have that as my first job because you can move out there, uh, cheap city to live in, really great city in a lot of ways, and had a professional job. Um, but like I'm sure a lot of people feel, uh, I still felt like I had a lot to learn. <laughs> like, I still have a lot of technical problems. Um, there was still a lot of stuff about my own bass playing that uh, maybe it was good enough to get past the audition, but um, I couldn't live with it, mm -hmm. I guess, put it that way. And so that year that I moved out there happened to be the year that Joel was in London as principal bass there full time. And I really missed out on, he was so busy with that that we didn't really talk very much. Um, and it was it was tough for me because I didn't, I didn't have like the guidance that I, I wanted to try and improve these skills. And uh, I described this recently to someone that's like going through school and getting this technique. It, um, it's sort of like radiation. Like <laughs> you get all this information thrown at you. And I, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anyone who's been through chemotherapy because like think, think everything that I haven't had to deal with that. But uh, you know, you, you get all this information over the time that you're there. And then for like years afterwards, things start keep on clicking, mm -hmm. right? Um, something someone said in a practice room finally clicks and it makes sense. And that's what I found was happening for me in my, my first year on the job in Winnipeg was that I was doing these things. Uh, maybe part of it was having to play like three programs a week and needing to figure out how to do that and how to survive. Um, but yeah, so basically uh, I made up this project um, I got a bunch of Arts Council funding, and the project was to go spend a month with Joel and write this book, uh, which basically formalized all the all the technical exercises into one thing. <laughs> and that was more for me than for anyone else, it was so that I could have another crack at uh, understanding what it all meant. Um, and that's what turned into the first Canadian School of Double Bass, which was the iBook that we, mm -hmm. we created. Um, the iBook was really cool at the time. You could, Apple published this free software where you could download it and you could embed videos and you could embed audio and you could embed pictures and you upload it to the you know, Apple thing and then um, people can download it and they have a technique book where there's actually someone demonstrating what something looks and sounds like. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was all just so that I could go back to Winnipeg and remember how to do exercises and remember what it should look like. 
we, we made it available to the public and we sold, you know, several hundred copies and people really liked it. So uh, that was sort of the beginning. And, and when was that happening? What, what year was that? So the, the project occurred in like 2015, but I think we released the book in 2016. Uh, something like that. Okay. I remember, and, I wonder if I bought that. Boy, does that, I, I, I remember there being some cool, I, I, I totally remember. Yeah. That we're going back like, like five years or so. Um, I yeah. remember, I remember, uh, get, get, uh, um, it's ringing a bell either way. It, I, it may be in my Apple purchases. I can't remember, but I, but okay, yeah. that's cool. So then, so then, uh, you've, you've been, you've it continued to evolve though. Well, it continued to evolve because, uh, like I said, a lot of this was just based off of exercises and routines you do with the students, uh, either, you know, through university or at places like Orford. Um, and, you know, Joel, Joel's a fantastic teacher. He's, he's the most incredible bass player I know, but he's also really busy. And so a lot of that stuff, you know, not not that it had mistakes in it, but it it's um, there are things that could have been clearer. Um, you know, just two months ago or something, he did a session with David Allen Moore, uh, and David was saying like, well, apparently I wasn't there, but uh, he was saying like, oh, you know, I really like this technique book, but you got nothing about the bow in it, and you know that that's true. <laughs> there was really not that much about the bow. Uh, specifically in that book. And that's something that sort of when you're there doing it at the program, um, you figure out how it makes sense because we're talking about it. But if you're someone in, uh, I don't know, Spain or Chile or something like that who just bought the book and they're trying to teach themselves to play the bass or trying to use it, it's not very helpful uh, in that aspect. So there are things like that that we need to change um, and then I also started teaching a lot. Like I was teaching at Sistema Winnipeg for almost the whole time I was there. Um, I started teaching at the University of Manitoba and uh, the Manitoba Conservatory. And I got a student in Carleton and like there was all this stuff happening. And I started using that book among other things to try and teach people. And I'd sort of see like, oh, like maybe that could be phrased better. Uh, maybe, maybe we need an exercise here about whatever, mm -hmm. um, about finding your weight with the bow on the string, um, stuff like that. And so we came up with a couple new exercises. Um, I think in the new publication that we just released, it's exercise three and exercise five, this thing that we call uh, the move. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, we were just calling that exercise zero uh, because we couldn't fit it into the, you know, we already had one, two, three, four, but this was like the most important thing. So where do you start? Right. Um, and then we have this problem that we call an exercise zero. So people didn't think it mattered at all. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, it's like anything, it gets better as it lives and better as uh, people use it. And we gain more, like we learned a lot from it too, um, in terms of what works for people and what kind of language to use. Uh, so many people take things incredibly literally and other people read a word and they, it goes in one ear and out the other. Um, so how to sort of phrase things and present things in a way that it becomes uh, clear that it's about like how your body should be moving, not necessarily where it should move to, but like, how does this work? Mm -hmm. um, which for me is something, I, I grew up with Samandal and Nanny and Bilay. And they do a great job of showing like where all the notes are, but they don't really, at least in my education, they didn't spend much time about how to get there, you know, like how to play that note. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's it's improving all the time. I'm sure we'll release another edition in five years or something that will probably be updated again. <laughs> well, and then you're taking taking advantage of continuing to take advantage of the technology because you've got all these videos linked up, which is we're, we're, I'm guessing a lot of that was re or maybe completely reshot for this new version. Uh, regardless, that's a whole heck of a lot of work. It's helpful, <laughs> but it's a, it's a it's a lot of making sure everything. But that but it's it's great to actually be able to see you know Joel demonstrating what's what's being described as well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really cool, and we've had a lot of good feedback feedback about that. Um, you know, I, I love technology and I also hate it. Uh, you and I 
probably feel the same way. And I think we experienced that with it or work with the ISB. It's like, yeah, we're, we're the tech people, but like, we're just bass players. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, one of, one of the big things that really upset me about this new edition is that in the, in the time between 2016 and now Apple has changed their publishing thing. So you can't actually, uh, do that thing with embedding videos anymore. Um, and I think that is because, you know, like that iBook was about a gigabyte, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a gigabyte in a bit. And I'm sure if everyone made a book that way, Apple's cloud space and everything would get overloaded. And so they, they took that ability away. Um, but we found with, with that, that, you know, a lot of, I love Apple products. Um, I don't really use them anymore, but there are a lot of people out there who don't have access to them because mm -hmm. they are more expensive than, you know, buying an Android phone or whatever. Um, but we found that with uh, Adobe, the programs have, have gone to a level where you can generate QR codes, you can put hyperlinks into things. Mm -hmm. And for people who want to print out their music and look at it, uh, now you can print it out and take your phone and scan the QR code. Or if you're like me and like I'm starting to read stuff off of a tablet more and more, uh, you can just click on the link with your finger and it will take you to these videos and examples. Um, a lot of those we shot new, a lot of them we wanted to shoot more, but again, our recording sessions got canceled because of restrictions here. Mm -hmm. And we just decided to go ahead and release the book anyway. And we have sort of, uh, I think there's one page that has like an old outdated video that doesn't really make sense. And I'm really looking forward to getting together with Joel again and uh, reshooting that. But yeah, it's, it's a good uh, flexible format. The books, they're 15 megabytes now, so you can you can put it in an email and send it to someone. Um, it's really easy to uh, upload to his website and, and deal with it that way. It works really well. It's a great way. To, it's a great way to do it, and and uh, also to be able to accommodate the folks that do want to have it printed out. Um, I've I've gone the tablet music r route uh, pretty pretty hardcore the last four years, and it's the the advantages. I I'm uh, certainly paper generation. You know, when I started college in the early '90s, and so I'm I'm uh, I miss aspects of that, but I'm also the sort of person that loses everything, and so I uh, having that all in digital form and four score on now exploring some other apps like music and and just having that all integrated like that and be able to take notes and reference things and bookmark things and set them out it's yeah. that it's um it's definitely a great way to do it in my opinion and i, I love the book it's a cool book of course set of Thanks. books really yeah. and I, I hope i hope that more people do that if, if anyone uh listens to this and wants to know how to do it please get in touch like mm -hmm. i was so surprised when we did this uh the original thing on ibooks i looked high and low for examples of music, um, you know, music technique books that were on iBooks. And there were a couple, none of them used any of the embedding or any of the, uh, the available things. There was just like a direct port of a PDF over to that. And I, I think it's a really, um, I think it's a really powerful thing. Um, you know, one of the first things that's said in the book is that we don't think it's possible to like train yourself how to play the bass uh, to a professional level just by using a book, but at least it gives you an idea of uh, how it actually looks from someone. And I think it does help a lot of people. It certainly helped me when I was being selfish. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, think, I don't think anything is going to replace the in-person experience, the actually working on one and one with someone. But you can get you can get to a certain sh level of shared knowledge. I think it's I think it's just beautiful. The more that you can get ideas like like what you've put out here and working with Joel on this, the the better. It's it's uh, I I've had yeah. so probably far too many conversations in the podcast over the years about um, you know like. Uh, uh, services like Discover Double Bass. I'll just use that example because I'm a part of that. Uh, is that replacing going to replace bass teachers? Well, no. It's the, all it's going to do is enhance those in-person experiences when you have them because you're just um, you're just being able to go through something that's curated and has had some thought put into it. So it's beautiful. I, I, as someone who's done a few projects uh, of his own, I, I I have an idea of the amount of time it takes to put something like this together and the intricacies and all that. So bravo! It's a it's a big job and it's got to be nice to get it out there and you know maybe you'll do an update in another five years but it's uh it's really cool i'm having fun working through it i'm getting ideas for doing some sort of review of it after i get good enough at some of the things to <laughs> do it intelligently yeah you know 
and I, it, it happens when I'm teaching people all the time. It, it's it's a big. Uh, there's some stuff in there that I'm sure is going to be very controversial. <laughs> How to use the hand and stuff, uh, but it, it's it's just another for me. It's it's been a fantastic tool in my toolbox, and it um, it's been the path for playing the way that I really want to be able to play. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I have a paralyzed vocal cord, so I, I used to sing a lot uh, when I was in high school, middle school, junior school, and I lost uh, use of that vocal cord when I was 17, and so I couldn't sing anymore. And all I ever wanted to do with the bass was figure out how to sing. And uh, with this technique, it's it's the thing that's got me the closest to that, um, which I love. I, I really love it. And I've seen a lot of people uh, before me and since since my time studying who have used it in an effective way, uh, either gone like full uh, Canadian school technique or just incorporated it in a way that, uh, you know, it, it works really well for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Love it, sir. It's great. I'll, I'll link up to that. And uh, your site, obviously, Joel's site. Um, uh, I got you on the podcast. It's, it's great, <laughs> great, great to chat and reconnect and uh, do something outside of the ISV confines. So confines yeah, might be the wrong yeah. word, but uh, <laughs> appreciate no, it. No, but, you know, it's, um, I have so much... Uh, like love and admiration for people like you who uh, inspire things like this, honestly. Um, it's, you know, like we, my, my experience as a student was so much, uh, I was given so much by some incredible people, you know, like Joel, um, I studied with a number of other people, either master classes or whatever, that there's this fantastic, just uh I guess we could call it a tradition of, of like one-on-one sharing between a master and a student and what we do, that it's unique to music in a lot of ways. Um, and I find it so inspiring to have people like, like you and, you know, like Jeff Chalmers discovered Oval Bass and uh, whatever, doing these, these projects that sort of share um, ideas and thoughts about things. And I think the effect that's having on, on the bass world is also great because um, I get the sense that people are coming into this, like the newer generations are coming into it with a much more open mind and less uh, tribalism, I guess, than, than there used to be. Um, and yeah, I just, I just hope that that keeps on getting better and better. So. Travis, thanks for chatting. Folks, check out the Canadian School of Double Bass and check out Travis online at travisharrison.ca or his Instagram page, and that's linked up in the show notes as well. I'm digging this Canadian School of Double Bass. I definitely have an in uh what, what, what uh, boy i can't even get the word <laughs> words on today a youtube review in mind it's sort of forming i'm in the early stages of kind of thinking about how that would go but they are very cool books i am using the fourth edition one of these days i'll play around with fifth tuning it seems very interesting to me but travis i love what you're doing i have so many good memories of working with you on the isb board and it's just really cool to see projects like this come out into the world so congratulations to you travis congratulations to Joel. Uh, Really great stuff. Thank you for listening and checking this out. Whether this is your first episode or your 805th or whatever the number is on this one, I appreciate you listening to these. I appreciate you sharing these on social media. That is always wonderful or emailing out to a friend about them. If you're on our email list, you can just forward to a friend. If you're not on our email list, um, join the club. We talk about a lot more than the podcast on there and you can get on that by just going Going to ContraBaseConversations.com slash email or just go to our website and you'll probably get prompted to join. So it'd be great to see you there as well. And of course, all the places you hang out, whether it's Instagram or 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 whatever. <laughs> I, I It'd be great to see you there. ContraBase Conversations is produced by Michael Cooper, Steve Hinchy, Mitch Mooring, and Trevor Jones. Mitch makes beautiful bases in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. You can learn more about his outstanding work at Mitch Mooring. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and we'll see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum.